Welcome back. In today's episode, we will be speaking with Dave Albin. Dave is the CEO and founder of Firewalk Adventures. He's going to share with you today how to use a firewalk to break through any fear and to accelerate your progress in any area of your life. Welcome to this edition of Peak, Peak Performance, Performance Podcast. Podcast with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become, become a peak, peak performer, performer in any area, area of, of your, your life, life or business. Thor Conklin here. We give you the tools, the tricks, the tips, the strategies, the technology, and the psychology peak performers use in order to get more done and execute better than 99.99% of the population. If you know what to do, but you struggle with getting it done, or you simply want to get more done, this podcast is for you. We have an absolutely incredible show for you tonight. You are going to love our guest, Dave Albin. Dave began firewalking in 1995. He later went on to run the firewalking experiences for T. Hart Beckard and Tony Robbins. He has successfully walked over 250,000 people worldwide and prides himself in the fact that no one has ever been seriously hurt on his watch. He leads events for major corporations around the world, including Google. So, Dave, did I forget anything there? Uh, well, just that part about, you know, I was on the advisory committee uh, when we created the universe. But other than that, you covered everything. Well, I'm sorry. I, I guess I missed that in the 18-page so bio. It's okay. It's okay. No worries, Thor. Well, you are a peak performer, so <laughs> I should have known. All right. So you got to tell us, how did you get involved in this firewalking thing? Well, it actually started when I was on a very painful path. Um, it, you know, it, it started in June 8th of 1988. I woke up that day and I was grossly addicted to drugs and alcohol and, and I was a real mess. You know, I was a plane crash, a, a train wreck and a five car collision rolled into one. And so, you know, there I was facing the demon looking me, you know, dead in the eye and I had a phone in one hand and a pistol in the other. And, you know, something had to change that day. The pain had to stop. And I made a phone call and I called this organization called Alcoholics Anonymous and they came and picked me up. They took me to four meetings that day and I've been living a life of sobriety ever since. As a result of living that life of sobriety, I had insomnia. And one night I was up late, I was watching an infomercial and there he was, the man himself, Mr. Anthony Robbins was selling his 30 day program uh, back. And again, this was in late 1988, maybe early 99. Mm. So you had the cassettes also. I had the cassettes, yeah. <laughs> I, I, if I'd ordered them like a year earlier, I think I could get, got them on eight-track tapes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, it was the dinosaur era of communication. But, man, you know, I plugged him in one day, Thor, and I started listening to him, and I did what the man taught me to do, and it worked. So as a result of that, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool someday to actually meet him and just, you know, no agenda, just go up and say, hey, Tony, I went through your program. Thank you. Your technology worked, and I'm very grateful. Well, in 1995, which was what, seven years later, a buddy of mine called me on the phone and said, hey, did you know Tony's coming to town? I'd actually given him uh, my 30-day program so he could use them. And he also read Tony's book. And I said, no, I didn't know that he was coming to town. He said, yeah, man, he's here for a four-day event, and you got me into this, so I was hoping you'd go with me. And uh, so I, I agreed. Our, our schedules uh, lined up and he called me back an hour later and he said, it's all done. We pick up the tickets at will call and here's the deal. Here's what they told us to do. Uh, dress casually, bring some snacks, hydrate, bring water, um, be prepared to spend a lot of time in the room and, uh, you know, bring a good attitude and be ready to play full out. And I'm like, Dan, you look, I just spent a thousand bucks. I'll play full out. So, um, and just as he got ready to get off the phone, he said, oh, oh, hey, and by the way, we're going to be doing a firewalk. <laughs> well, I, I literally held the phone away from my head, right? And I'm thinking to myself, there is no way in hell I'm doing a firewalk. That's insane. And you know what's interesting? I didn't even know what that really meant. But I knew one thing. I wasn't going to do it. But... You know, I didn't want my buddy to think I'm a wuss, so I'm like, you know, okay, yeah, sure, yeah, we'll do a fire walk. Sounds really interesting. I hung up the phone and said, hell no. Nope, I'm not going to do that. Well, you know, you, you get to the event. Tony takes the stage at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and the next thing I know, it's after midnight. And now I'm out in a parking lot with 3,000 people, 
And, you know, he's got us when we're walking out there, we're chanting, yes, yes. And I'm over here going, no, no, <laughs> this is not going to happen. So there's a huge bonfire built over in the corner and he's got these African drummers. So the, you know, the stage is set. It's intense. And so I positioned myself all the way at the back. Yeah, because- so did I when I did my first one. <laughs> well, then you, then you know Tony's people know where all the cowards are. <laughs> well, right? I, I, I was just making sure that everybody else was safe in the back. Yeah, oh, I like that. Well, I wasn't. I was, I got to tell you, I was like, I'm sitting at the back. I'm not doing it. And so this guy comes up to me, one of Tony's people. And to this day, I don't know who it is. And I'm gr- very grateful to this man, that's for sure. But he walks up to me, and, he, and I must have had a pretty scared look on my face because he said, are you okay? And I'm like, and of course, when we're not okay, what do we say? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> and so he said, um, well, are you going to walk tonight? Well, I kind of leaned into him, and very aggressively, I said, absolutely not. And he kind of backed up, right? He was kind of like startled. And he said, hey, that's not a problem. We don't want you to do anything you don't want to do. And I went, wow, I like this guy. He's my ticket to hell out of here. And then he asked me a question that forever changed my life. And that was, well, wouldn't you at least like to watch? And I said, well, yeah, actually, I would. And he said, well, you know, you're not going to be able to see anything from here. You're going to have to get in line. (laughs) Interesting. Yeah. And that did. And he was telling me the truth. You you know, that's true. I couldn't see anything from me. I had 3,000 people standing for me. I couldn't see anything. Now, I could hear it. I could see the glow of the coals and this kind of thing, but it was so dark out, I, I couldn't see anything. So I got in line, and I'm kind of sitting there, and I'm moving along, and I'm moving along. And next thing I know, Thor, I, I look to my right, and I look over, and I can actually see people walking. And I'm thinking to myself, you have got to be kidding me. They, <laughs> they're doing this. This is real. And, you know, and I'm seeing all kinds of people, you know, tall, short, black, white, didn't make any difference, young, old. People were walking. Well, the next thing I know, another guy comes up to me. And he said, he knows when you're ready. When he says go, <laughs> you go. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, you, you know where you can go. Get away from me. I'm looking. I'm not going to do this. And so, you know, everybody's really in a tight formation. So, again, you can't really see much in front of you. You can see off to the sides. And the next thing I know, there I am. I'm standing at the front of the line. And I'm looking down at the coals and they're glowing hot you know the red and it's and you can feel the heat coming off the wheelbarrow because what they did is they took wheelbarrows over to those big pits they put the coals in the wheelbarrows they brought the wheelbarrows and they would put them in in between the lanes and then they had a shoveler who would shovel the coals out on these lanes of sod because we're in a parking lot on asphalt so they you know again they laid down grass so we could walk on it and uh and i'm staring at the coals and 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 i'm scared to death i mean my heart is pumping out of my chest and there's a trainer standing there And he said, eyes up. And he screams at me, right? Well, I remember when we were in the room, Tony said, look, don't stare at the coals. Don't stare at what you feel. Fear, look to the end. Look to the celebration side of this. And so now my eyes are up and I'm not looking down. And he said, squeeze your fist and say yes. And I went, yes. And he went, stronger. And I went, yes. And then he screams at me. And he screams at me so loud he's pissed me off. And, and I scream at the top of my lungs. I throw my hands in the air, and I'm like, yes! Right? And he goes, go, go, go! And, and I'll be damned. I took off. <laughs> right? So, so, so here's the first thing I learned about firewalking. When you take the first step, you're, you're pretty much guaranteed to take the second, third, fourth, and fifth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not like you stop. Well, they had a couple of guys positioned at the end of the lane to stop you. And so they're like, stop, wipe your feet, and celebrate. And so I'm wiping my feet, and, and, and the next thing I know, this girl reaches in and grabs me by the shirt, and she's, and she's going, you did it, you did it, you did it. And she's, at the same time, moving me out of the way of the lane because we have somebody else that's going to be coming in um, you know, behind us. Yeah. And so I'm going, I did it, I did it, I did it. And I go, no, I didn't. I'm immediately dismissing it. That, you know, and I'm looking back, and I'm thinking, and, and you know, there they are. They're, you know, I had done it. There was no question. There was no tricks. I'm like, okay, what the hell just happened? How did I do that? And so there's like this guy standing next to me, and he's got his pants rolled up. And I looked over at him, and I said, excuse me, but did you just walk? And he goes, yeah. And I said, did you burn yourself? And I said, no. He said, no. Well, and here's what I'm going through. I'm thinking all of a sudden, oh, my God, I burnt the hell out of myself. Yeah, I can't feel it. (laughs) I can't feel it, right? You know, it's like you get that cut on your arm, and you you don't feel it until you see the blood. 
And so now I'm looking at my left foot and it's really dirty, but there's no burns. And then I look at my right foot. It's really dirty, but there's no burns. So at that moment, you know, now I'm asking people, I'm interviewing, I'm looking for somebody that's been burnt. And I don't know how many people I asked, but I got the same answer. The answer was no. And that was the moment in my life, that definitive moment when, and you know, I, I recognized it too, because that's the same fear thought process that I used to have about a lot of things that had deprived me of all kinds of things. For example, you know, my, my junior high school dance when I wanted to ask Sandy Dominici to, to dance. There I was looking at her in the eyes. She's looking at me. I'm looking at her. And, 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 I'm, and fears, I'm ready to pee my pants because of this pretty girl that I want to ask to, to dance. I'm already at the dance. She's looking at me. And guess what? Did I ask her to dance? No. And so there it was. I recognized what that was. And if you want to use the acronym of fear, forget everything and run. Well, at that moment in my life, I changed it because now it was now it was, you know, face everything and rise. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. You know, it's funny. I went through a similar experience. I did my first uh, fire walk in 1988 and you did it in 95. And that's when those fire lanes were long. They're, they're not like what they are today. And I remember literally uh, she wasn't my wife at that at that point. Uh, but we, she was my fiance. I'm like, you go first. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, sure. If you can do it, then I'll do exactly. it. Exactly. Right? If you make it across, I'll, I'll follow. Um, the real man in the relationship. <laughs> but, you know, it for me, it took seeing other people doing it. And it's such an important uh, process that if we see others succeeding, it gives us the courage to do it. You now teach this. I mean, you are a master. Uh, what, what's your exact title? You're like beyond the, the trainer. You're like the trainer's trainer. Who are you besides master of the universe? <laughs> well, you know, as you know, I was on the advisory committee there. So, <laughs> yes. um, well, you know, what developed was what, from that moment on, um, uh, what happened was I wanted to know more. So I, got, I found out that Tony uses several hundred uh, volunteers to facilitate his firewalk. So I contacted Ros Robin's Research after the event. They sent me an application. I filled it out, and I got chosen. And so it was like a later in 1995, I found myself at a Tony Robbins seminar as a volunteer. When I was registering, I'm standing in line, and I met this guy named John. And, uh, you know, he's, he'd been there several times. And so he's saying, hey, you know, the, he was kind of giving me, you know, the, the inside what to do and what not to do. And uh, they were uh, registering everybody alphabetically. So I'm over in the A's and he was over in the T's, I think it was, or whatever. And so I get registered. And when I register, they'd already pre-picked what I was going to do. And sure enough, fate would have it. I'm on the fire building team. Well, I'm excited as hell, right? I'm thinking, oh, sweet. This is where I want to be. So I meet up with John, you know. I don't know, 10, 15 minutes later, and he said, hey, how's it going? What, what job did you get? And I said, hey, I'm on the fire building team. And he goes, oh, man, I'm sorry to hear that. Who did you piss off, right? And I'm like, <laughs> like what do you mean? He goes, dude, you're going to be outside all day. You're not going to be in the room. You won't be around Tony, you know, on and on and on about how bad that was. And so I'm thinking, damn it, you know, did I screw up here? You know, what's going on? So anyway, you know, I got on the fire building team, and um, I fell in love. I just, I loved it all. You know, it was, the, it was the work. It was, you know, unloading the wood, stacking it, making kindling, laying the lanes, the physical side of it. You know, I, I had a farm at that time in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. It's where I raised my family. And so, you know, I liked it. I enjoyed being outside. I'm, you know, I'm a surfer boy, gone mountain man these days. But, uh, you know, I just loved being outside. And I loved being part of that team. And so the next thing I know, a couple years later, I'm driving down the road and my phone rings and it's a it's a, a gal by the name of Jennifer Pritchard who was with Tony's office and she said, hey, David, this is Jen Pritchard from Tony's uh, office. I've got a very interesting offer for you. And so when you were a volunteer, right, Thor, you have to pay your way. So it was costing me a couple thousand bucks every time I went to an event because so, you're paying your airfare, you're paying your hotel, yep. you're paying all your expenses. Well, she said, hey, we'd like to hire you as a subcontractor. You'll become the assistant fire captain with the fire captain now, who's Hal Taylor. And Hal Taylor was great to learn under you know, his watch because Hal had a safety engineering degree from Texas A&M. So he was all about the safety. And he taught me there's three ways to do a firewalk, safe, safer, and safest. And so you know, we've always implemented that policy. 
Well, there, there I was. When I became part of that team in, 19, in 1997, they found out I had a security background in the military and I was in the security business. So, you know, they, they hired me also as a subcontractor uh, to take part of the security team to help with uh, taking care of the celebrities and VIPs that were coming to Tony's event. So I got, I got uh, drafted into that uh, role as well. So I was serving, you know, two teams here. I would come in, do the fire walk on the first couple of days, and then the rest of the weekend I was uh, doing security. And that was in 97. And then in 2003, Tony pulled me in and said, hey, you know, uh, I want to offer you the position of taking over all my fire walks globally. And here's what's really interesting about that moment. The same fear that had stopped me from asking Sandy to, the, to, to, to dance, the same fear that almost stopped me from doing my first fire walk, that was the same fear that was talking them. That little, that little guy that jumps up uh, you know, on our shoulder, the little fear bastard, if you will, and was telling me, oh my God, you're not, you're not good enough to do this. What if you screw up? Blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, the, the voice in my head, which was face everything and rise again, was, you got this, dude. You know what you're doing. Step up. You know, and 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 honor Tony and honor this whole process, and uh, you know, so I accepted the position, and so there I was, um, you know, fire captain for the Anthony Robbins companies, and that uh, started again 2003, and I, then I did my last event for Tony as his fire captain in uh, 2014. Last October, the Entrepreneurs Organization here in Atlanta, which is a comprised of 150 entrepreneurs, asked me to put on a Firewalk. I said, sure, let's, let's do it. And I went out and I found the best and I found Dave and Dave was the guy. So Dave came in and did a firewalk for our organization in Atlanta. And the part Dave that you don't know, that event was selected as a finalist as the best learning event in the organization EO global. So there's 22,000 entrepreneurs globally and our event in Atlanta was a finalist for the best learning event with the biggest impact for 2015. Shut the front door. <laughs> um, no, I had I had no idea. I, I mean, I'm hearing this for the first time. I, you know, I, I it was an amazing event, as you know. We had so much fun. Um, the EO participants, those guys were so awesome. They had such a great time. Um, but wow, what a what an honor, yeah. and you know that's incredible. Well, you, you put on a, an amazing event. Uh, no one was hurt. Everything went great, and to this day, still people walk around with their wristbands that say, "I am a firewalker." Sweet. Well, that's awesome. Well, you know, it shifts your identity. You know, it, uh, firewalking creates a paradigm shift, and it works. And though we use it in the West as a motivational and inspirational exercise if you look if you look deep into firewalking and that's what's interesting thor i never knew the part i'm about to share with you until years and years later i was very one-dimensional here i was tony robbins we did it a certain way we did it the same way every time and but what i didn't know is um, a few years after i started working for tony as his fire captain i was approached by peak potentials which is the t harv ecker companies and uh, T. Harv, of course, wrote the book, The Millionaire Mindset. He uses firewalks, too, just like Robert Kiyosaki and, and other motivational uh, trainers and speakers. And he does it a completely different way. Um, it, it's very quiet. It's very ceremonial. It's more tribal. And that's when it really opened up to me. We did a, I did a firewalk for him up in Fresno on an Indian reservation. And so, you know, I was hired. And when I sat down with him, I said, so, you know, what's the theme? How do you guys lay this out? And they said, well, here's how we like to do it. But we'd like you to incorporate, you know, your own style. And so we, we did it that way. We laid out, um, you know, four lanes and there were four. There was one group for each lane. And it was actually very tribal again. So there they were with their tribe. So there was no there was no chanting there was no clapping there was no you know make your move there was all the all the things that i had been doing with tony had com been, was completely different with him and so there i was one night on this moonlit night up here on an indian reservation in fresno california and it was absolutely gorgeous and there was a there was a there was an energy there there was something that i had never felt before and that was the moment that i realized that this 2000 year old experience um, was something that was much, much deeper on a level that 
it was being used as a, as a rite of passage. It was, you know, the, if you, again, if you go back and you research it, firewalking has been around since 2000 BC. And it was really instituted by the Indo Europeans. And what they did is they prepared the minds of their warriors. So when these guys were getting ready to go into battle, I mean, great battle, they, the, the, the last thing they did before they went into battle was they did a firewalk. Um, and then, of course, the American Native, Native Indians did the same thing. They used it as that rite of passage. So a brave didn't become a brave until he firewalked. A, 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 you know, a young female Indian was, wouldn't become you know, a woman, if you will, into womanhood. So they, they, needed for, they needed it for survival because, you know, obviously, if you look at the Cherokee Indians, for example, they lived outside. They had to do something that would unite and bring that tribe together with trust and honor and respect and show the whole tribe that you can step through your fears. It works for, you know, entrepreneurs and it works for anybody. You know, my kids, uh, my daughter was uh, six years old and my son was nine years old the first time they did their first firewalk. Oh, that's awesome. Well, yeah, now some would call that child abuse, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, I can tell you that my kids now have firewalked many, many times and it empowered them greatly. So, you know, the cool thing about a firewalk is once you've done it, you can't undo it, because, <laughs> right? Because now your brain's like, okay, if we can, if we can do that, what else is possible? Absolutely. What else can we do? Absolutely. You know, you are absolutely a peak performer, but with everyone, including myself, there's been some epic failures. What what did you really screw up? Well, I you know I'm I'm also a professional screw upper, uh, no doubt about that. Uh, a lot of my screw ups came from uh, my drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, I've been married four times, uh, though in my own defense, three of them I was under the influence. So I didn't have a successful marriage until after I got sober, which was like I said earlier on June eighth of nineteen eighty eight. You know, that part was, uh, I, I, left, um, I left casualties all over the place. Uh, to this day, I'm still working on that part of my life where I want to be uh, a better uh, life partner, if you will. I've been, I, I got a divorce uh, a few years ago, and uh, I've, been, I've been single ever since, and I've gone on one date. And I can tell you that, it, you know, it was over when they served the soup, <laughs> what I say. <laughs> You know, it was, it was I, I can tell you, I knew right then, but yeah. before I finished my soup, it was over. Yeah. Everybody gets to the point where it's no more. I'm done. I, you know, I've got to make a change. And you, and you alluded to that and you told us what happened. Is there something that happened that was the light bulb went off? It was like, no, now it's got to change. Yeah. Uh, motivated by the pain and pleasure, you know, um, we'll do more to avoid pain than we will to gain pleasure. And for me, it was about becoming very aware of my story, the story I tell myself and the story I used to tell myself. Um, in fact, if you were to ask Robbins, uh, Tony, you know, what's one specific teaching that you that you master? And he said, you know, it's all about your story because change your story, change your life. You know, people don't, why don't people get what they want in life? I, I do this on a regular basis. I ask people when they come to my firewalks, I, I, the thought provoking question is, so why don't people get what they want in life? And you know, I get a lot of really great answers, but the driving answer to me is, there's a story we tell ourselves why we can't have it. I'm too young, I'm too old, I don't have the time, I don't have the money, I don't have the education, I don't have the resources. I'm a poor white boy from the Bronx. I'm a poor Hispanic boy from the Bronx. I'm a poor black man from the Bronx. So, you know, selectively, it's real simple. Change your story, change your life. And that's what it's all about. And in addition to that, I would also say a lot of my life is now influenced by who I spend time with. Love your family, choose your friends, but choose wisely because you will become who you spend time with. And that's a great point. Who do you spend time with now? I look, you know, I'm looking for people like you, um, literally, you know what I mean? I, 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 first of all, I admire and respect you greatly. You've, you're doing some really great things with this podcast and, you Thank know, you. I, oh, you're, you're quite welcome. It's really awesome. I learned a long time ago, you can turn your car into a university on wheels and that's really what you've set up here. So, you know, turn off, you know, it's great that you listen to music. I use music to get me in a great mood, in a great state. Uh, but at the end of the day, I also want to use my car time as a university. And so, um, you know, that's that's what I've done as well. 
that's really the, 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 the two parts, right? You know, spend time with the right people and make sure you're telling yourself the right story of who you really are. The I am, if you will. I've got a great friend of mine, Thor, that uh, uh, believed he developed a program that can really turn around the public school system. And so here's what he developed. So he, he developed it and he went into the school board in the state of Louisiana and he said, guys, here's what it is. And they, he told them and the board and the uh, board of uh, education said no. And so he went back and he kept asking. Well, he got the door shut in his face. I don't know how many times. And then finally, they got so tired of listening to him. They said, OK, fine. Tell you what. You see that school right over there? Go help them. If you can help them, then we'll listen to them. Well, of course, they sent him to the worst school in the state it was all the rejects. And so the first thing that, that my buddy did, Damien did, he uh, took the fifth grade class and he took him into the auditorium. And he set him down and he found a, somebody, you know, one of the students who was good at uh, administrative and could write on the chalkboard. And so he brought her up and he said, okay, so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to define who you guys really are. The I am of who you really are. I want to know what your heart says. I don't, want to, I, don't want to, I don't want you to write down what your parents have told you or what your peers have told you or what a rap singer has told you. I want to know who you really are at your core. So they wrote down all these things. You know, I am successful. I am smart. I am brilliant. I'm caring. I'm loving. I'm kind. So the whole board was full of all these positive, influential words. Well, then what Damien did is he drew up a contract with all the kids. And he had all the con all the kids sign that contract and they had to keep you keep a copy of it with them for I think it was like 30 days or 60 days so then in addition to that he found out who the, all the bullies were and he took the bullies and he said okay so here's what we're going to do with these guys he said John you see that girl right there that's Susie she's a fifth grader she gets picked on all the time here's what I want you to do I want I want you to become her protector <laughs> nice Right. So if anybody's messing with her, you put an end to it. Nice. Don't get don't get physical, but you just step up to her aid, up to her aid. And in fact, if kids are bothering her, you just go walk up and stand by her and stare at them. This is what went on within the contract. It said, look, if I find you operating outside of who you really are, you give me permission to come in and say, hey, uh, Thor, that's not who you are. Here's who you really are. So w they would bring themselves back to source when they saw each other operating outside of that of that contract and who they really are. Well, then here's where the magic really started to take hold. The fifth graders taught it to the fourth graders. The fourth graders taught it to the third graders, and then the and then the fifth grader class oversaw the fourth and the third graders as they taught the students, you know, the grade under them. And here's where. Here's the statistic, if you will. So when Damien started that school, the grade point average was 61. And it went from 61 in two years, he took it to an 89. Wow. So what he's developing now is kind of the same concept for corporate America. That's kind of where I'm going now is to take not only that concept, but my firewalking and glass walking and board breaking and other fear-based metaphors you know, team building exercises that we could take into corporate America and really create just incredible top 10 experience in people's lives and really create powerful, powerful um, uh, paradigm shifts. Man, what, what a great, uh, what a great mission. What, what's, what's one of the biggest hurdles you uh, have to overcome this year? Procrastination is mine. And, you know, keeping keeping centered in who I am and my mission and who I really am and and to make sure that, you know, I'm doing this uh, to serve and uh, keep my ego in check. So it, for me, it's really to focus on. And I think it was Napoleon Hill that said, you know, do enough, uh, show enough people how to get what they want in life. And you're sure enough to get exactly what you want in your life. I'm paraphrasing that a little bit. Sure. But that's really that's really the gist of it. Right. Because here's what I learned. Life sucks when it's all about me. And so when you can define, when you have that divine purpose and the driving force is to help others get what they want. Because for me, having firewalked over 250,000 people, the next day I see them come in and I see the change in them. Uh, that is something that I'm absolutely addicted to. Yeah. So for me, the biggest hurdle is just to make sure that I'm totally centered in and around uh, serving others at a very high level. Well, you know, and procrastination comes up for a lot of people, even peak performers. And a lot of times it's because they just have too much on their uh, their schedule. For you, why does the procrastination come up? It's an old pattern. 
I was uh, I dealt with the self worth and the self esteem and the self confidence issues way back when they were deep seated as a result of my um, my alcohol and drug abuse. So uh, even today, what, right? I'm 28 years uh, sober, uh, but every once in a while, well, thank you, thank you. I, you know, people say that a lot, and I'm like, you know, you don't have to congratulate me because all I really did is I just stopped trying to kill myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, but but for some, that that's a difficult process. That's not easy. It, it's not. Um, it's not. It's not easy at all. Except AA works if you work it. And so, and again, that that whole that whole model is in and around helping others because it, when you when you work through the twelve steps and you get to the you get to that final step, that's what the twelve step is. It's about helping others achieve sobriety. So I found great reward in that. I, you know, I'll never forget the first guy I went out on a twelve step call, and and you know he he wanted he wanted help, and so what they would do is they would call AA and they'd get a hold of the groups, uh, and you know they would send we'd send a couple of guys out. We always went in twos, and we would go out and do that. So I found how rewarding that was to go out and help another alcoholic achieve sobriety. Same thing with firewalking, break their break them out of that limiting belief system and and install a new one and and look at the glow on their face the next day or that night. <laughs> Um, but it's it's a written system. It, it it's written. There's steps to it. You follow the steps. You execute on the steps, and then you get the results. Yep. Success leaves clues. That's for sure. Well, so does failure. Yeah. And and that's really it for me. You okay. know, because um, you know, in my business, I do 99% of all the work. So every once in a while, I you know, I live in such a beautiful scenic place. It's easy for me to get wrapped up and, you know, just wanting to go drive around and look at my beautiful surroundings because I live up here in the western mountains of North Carolina and the Appalachian Mountains right here on the Blue Ridge Parkway. So my little cabin up here sitting up in the mountains is a little piece of heaven. So, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, it's what I do. I keep myself charged. I keep myself focused. Uh, but pr pr procrastination is my is my number one uh, threat. That concludes part one of our interview with Dave Albin. Please keep an eye out for part two later this week. Question of the day. Where have you allowed fear, face everything and run, to control things? And really the way you should be looking at it is forget everything and rise. Call to action, schedule time in your calendar, and create that shift where you turn fear into power by just facing it and going right through it. Thank you for listening. If you've not already subscribed, please go to the show on iTunes, subscribe. Please download all 33 episodes. Leave us a five-star rating. Also, share this episode with friends, family, coworkers, or anyone that could benefit from this information. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Thor Conklin. Website is thorconklin.com. Email is info at Thor Conklin. Remember, these episodes are short, anywhere between 6 minutes and 35 minutes. So please listen to them during dot time, doing other things, running, jogging, working out, commuting, driving, or anything where you can do two things at once. Decide to be a peak performer in all that you do. And until tomorrow, have an absolutely amazing day.